Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie with Peter Ward. Peter, you're talking about the lack of insects that are out there. Are there any telltale signs that can prove or show you this could be the beginning of a mass extinction event? Yeah, because it's not just the insects. Again, it is many scientists have been thinking about trying to take a survey. And, and the ones, it's really the amateurs, George, the people that do it for the love of it instead of a professional need. And I'm thinking of the birders. I mean, the people who study birds and love birds, you know, they gather and in large numbers and they have get-togethers and try to see how many species do we see, how many individuals do we see. They share those numbers. And so that citizen science point of view, taking the census of the bird populations is in parallel. And look, I mean, so many birds eat insects. If you have a reduction in insects, you're starving birds to death. So kind of it, it, it makes total sense. And in my own field, I'm more of a marine biologist than not. Just seeing what's happened to the oceans that I've worked in where overall fishing has just really removed most of the big fish. Uh, it, it's interesting, in 2014-2016, scientists started saying that the squid and octopus are increasing in large numbers because they're predators. The, the big fish are gone. The sharks are gone. And so we're seeing big changeovers taking place. What's happening to those fish? Are they being fished out of the water by humans or what? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and for instance, I, I did a, a, a really interesting 90 minutes with two other scientists. And I, I have a good friend named Nate Hagens who is really a, a, a really interesting person thinking about the changes, he's an economist. And one of the other scientists on this program with me was telling a story about what's happened to sardines in the Mediterranean. I mean, if you think about the Mediterranean diet, and there's so much of it, they're eating sardines. It's a big part of so many different diet food sources in that cuisine have it. Well, it turns out the mafia is taking over as much of the sardine harvest as they can. They're feeding young tuna in pens, growing the tuna on the sardines, and sending them to Japan. And I said, well, wait a minute. This is a silly story. And this guy is a very famous marine ecologist, fisheries guy from Spain, and it's not silly at all. So we're really seeing the removal of fish at, a, at, a, at an enormous rate. Are these extinction events reversal? Can they be reversed? Well, people are trying to do that in zoos, aren't they? What is a zoo but a, a, an attempt to reverse the removal of really rare animals? You don't put the common stuff in zoos. We don't have any rat zoos or cockroach zoos. We put in the stuff that we're afraid is really going to leave. And in some cases, it's many species are only living in zoos. How many pandas are there in the wild compared to how many you have now in various breeding facilities? And there's lots and lots of examples of that taking place. Some animals just need so much real estate to make a living. Big animals, for instance, elephants, that with more and more farm fields, there's just not enough real estate to keep a big animal alive. So zoos become the next best thing, and that becomes a reversal of extinction. Let's go to the phones for you, Peter. Let's start with Neil in Santa Monica, California. Welcome to the show. Hello, Neil. Hey, guys. How are you guys doing? Uh, yeah, Mr. Ward, yeah, we spoke before. I was telling you about the dead zones in the ocean, if you recall. I do, and boy, those dead zones keep getting both deader and bigger. It's the bigger, the scarier. Right. right, and okay, so I'm author of the book, The Conscious Planet. Uh, there's seven chapters in my book on endangered species, including one chapter on endangered spiders and insects. I can tell you the cause and the solution to this problem. 
91% of all rainforest destruction is due to animal agriculture. The solution, people should go vegan. The latest research states that rainforest destruction is 200,000 acres a day. This is killing trillions of wild animals. Thousands of species are becoming endangered. Uh, I remember having an argument with Dr. Tim Ball on, on George's show where Tim Ball completely denied that the rainforests were being destroyed. Uh, we have 8 billion people on this planet, and we feed 10 times as many crops to animals as what people eat. Most of these crops are GMO crops, so that those GMOs are causing the bees to go extinct. We've already lost 90% of the wild bee populations, according to the statistics. Um, and this is causing, wow. the, the wild bees going extinct is causing colony collapse disorder, okay? Well, the bees cannot find their way back to the hive. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, and we already mentioned the fertilizer uh, uh, from all the feed crops, uh, killing all the, the birds and all sea life in the ocean for hundreds of square miles. All right, let's get Peter's reaction, uh, Neil, to some of this. What do you think, Peter? I, I, yeah, I can't argue with any of that. He's absolutely correct. It really, it's amazing that in Central America and other areas, rainforests are cut down to grow grass, to grow beef, to put in McDonald's burgers. We are literally cutting down the forest for hamburgers. I mean, that sounds ridiculous, and it's a reality. Stupidity at its right. best, huh? Yeah, it's uh, just, if you think about how many tons of grass it takes for a cow, and then you think about how much food could come out of that grass if it were wheat. I mean, how many people could be fed on a, a, an acre of wheat versus an acre of grassland that supports one or two cows? It's just all about trophic levels. And it, it is, I think, as we move forward, uh, the eating of meat is going to, to be more and more destructive to nature on this planet. Peter, what's your vision of the planet 50 years from now? Well, unfortunately, one of my visions happened just a year ago. I went to Papua New Guinea, and I was there to study coral reefs. And I had to go through the city of Port Moresby, which is right on the equator. I mean, right on the equator. And there's hundreds of thousands of people living in Port Moresby. Papua New Guinea uh, populace is centered there. Um, the reef is right up against the shore, so what reefs do when they're close to land is they're like little moats. And so you put a wall around the city of uh, Port Moresby, tens of thousands of people live in stilled houses on the shore that is abutting this moat. And so because they have no sewage systems, they have holes in the floor. So you've got these houses with a hole and human waste goes down into the moat. There's no circulation of seawater there. It is always 95 degrees, so 90% humidity. There is no wind because you are at exactly at the equator in the doldrums. And that, to me, became the vision of what this planet could be. It's kind of like a Christmas carol. The ghost of Christmas future, if we don't change yeah. things around. Let's talk again about the whale. What's the biggest whale out there? I'm not a, a complete whale expert or even a partial whale expert. Certainly the blue whales are up there. But I thought that, that the fin whale, which was as large or larger, not as heavy. But look, so many of your listeners are going to know better than I, and probably you do. I don't know. I know the blues are pretty big. Um, they're certainly, <laughs> compared to dinosaurs, th these are massive animals. So it, it, it'd be such a shame to lose them. What kind of whale was Moby Dick? Moby Dick had to have been a sperm whale, wasn't it? I mean, just sperm whales are, are just nasty. They're and they're huge. Intelligent. And again, they're, they're big predators. I always thought that you'd have to be way smarter to be a sperm whale because you've got to track down squid, and the squid don't want to get caught. So there's got to be much more thought involved. Um, the big whales that simply use baleen and are just pushing their way through big plankton fields, I don't think you need a lot of intelligence for that. Certainly communication and keeping the group together, but predators are often very much smarter than herbivores, and I would imagine that it's the toothed whales, like the dolphins, that are smartest and probably killer whales smartest of all. 
You know, and like you said, maybe back uh, 2,000 years ago, they had extreme heat, but nobody kept records then. Well, that's right. And it wasn't uh, global warming. What could it have been? A well, we cycle? Know that we, we've got lots of variations. The ice cores have shown us this, but certainly, and since we have been keeping records, what we're seeing in the last several decades is different. I mean, it's it's totally different. Did you hear the story about a scientist beginning to think that gravity is beginning to decompose? I certainly heard some very interesting things, not so much about gravity decomposing, but about the gravitational aspects of the deep inner Earth. Um, there have been some very strange new studies coming out about the deep, deep gravitational waves within the very in, inner part of the core. I haven't heard that about gravity itself. But, you know, the older I get, the stranger things seem. It's perhaps less and less surprising. What would happen if gravity completely went away? Would we just float off the planet? We would certainly float off the planet, but again, as long as there's a planet there, there's going to be gravity. So that that is not going to be one of our problems. But the bigger problem is going to be if we keep putting gases up in the atmosphere that are affecting climate over the way that they seem to be. You know, we used to have a lot of hydrogen on planet Earth, but hydrogen is very light, and it did float away. And this is, again, Poor Mars not having enough mass to have enough gravity to keep its gases in. Some scientists are beginning to say if we delete the carbon dioxide or diminish it, we could be creating another problem. Oh, it'd be worse. Oh, yeah. This is a hilarious thing that people don't understand. Right now, our biggest problem seems to be is way too much carbon dioxide. But if you made every bit go away, uh, we would all be dead in a very short period of time. We'd be dead from starvation because without carbon dioxide, you're not going to have photosynthesis and therefore no plants. You don't have plants, you don't have oxygen. But we would get really cold in a big, big hurry. You remove all CO2 out of the atmosphere and the oceans are going to freeze. Peter, what got you interested in paleontology? Dinosaurs, dinosaurs, dinosaurs. Like a kid, you know, it's just what is it about those big beasts that so entrances us as kids? I was lucky enough to run into a couple of great books, um, Dinosaurs from the, the Great American Museum of Natural History, Expeditions to the Gobi Desert, Roy Chapman Andrews, all about dinosaurs. And I love the old dinosaur movies and even those little clay models that went squeak, squeak, squeak. Yeah. And I was lucky enough to stay a kid my whole life. I still, I was out in Kansas three weeks ago, George, digging up mosasaurs from the Kansas Chalks. We found three pterosaur wings. We were in great heat, but what a great life. Would you love to see a live Tyrannosaurus Rex? Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. The other cool thing would be any of those big marine reptiles, because things look bigger underwater, so even a large size is going to be larger size yet. Um, I've been lucky enough to see really big sharks underwater, and it's pretty terrifying. It's, it's like going by a big ship. So it's going by and going by and going by and going by. Big. I think I'd be amazed if I saw a Baronosaurus. Yeah, it'd be fabulous. The other aspect about it, though, how's it going to walk? What's this What's his attitude? What's the tail doing? Remember, you and I as kids, the tails were dragged, and then we get to more and more people really understanding the science of their bodies, and those tails are held straight back behind them. Sometimes there was, there was a, a study by people here in Seattle, the tails could whip in you know, such a way that it would be a, a formidable weapon. Yes, that would be fabulous to see. What was your famous dinosaur as a kid? You know, there are bunches of them, but I like the Allosaurus, not the big T-Rex, because that was way too famous, but Allosaurus. And there was a wonderful old cheesy movie, One Million B.C., with Raquel Welch. Raquel, I remember that, yeah. But the dinosaurs in it, there was one scene, because the the T-Rexes are so huge, it's out of scale, and you're you're looking, it's like Godzilla, some big monster that's so tall, it, it doesn't seem... You could scale it to yourself, but they had this allosaurus come running into a camp, and it was just a little taller than a human. 
That's an interesting thing to be thinking about, where you've got a biped your size with those big, wicked teeth. That could do real havoc to any group of humans. I'd like to see a real stegosaurus, wouldn't you? Stegosaurus would be great, but once again, what would it look like? Are those plates sticking up vertically, as you used to think, or are they laid down to the side? You know, what makes more sense to protect the backbone? And just, it'd be very interesting to see how our reconstructions really mesh up with the reality of it. Or a pterodactyl. Pterodactyls would be cool, too. Did they have feathers? Did they have fur? Were they just, as we saw as kids, just naked skin out there? And more and more, we're thinking these things had feathers and fur. Would they swoop down and pick you up? Yeah. The, the, again, I was lucky enough, we were in, in the, the Kansas Badlands, and I'd never been. It's white chalk, and it's a, it's a very great interior seaway, the fossils in it. So we were lucky enough in western Kansas to spend days out there. And the chalk itself is filled with really cool marine creatures. It was the bottom of an ocean. These pterodactyls would die, fall into the ocean, sink to the bottom. There was no oxygen on the bottom, so no scavengers tore them apart. And you saw these absolutely delicate bones out there. I mean, it was an amazing trip. We were living in this nasty, nasty little motel. Uh, I was with paleontologists from the Burke Museum, one of my good friends, Christian Cedar. Christian didn't have a lot of money, so he said, Peter, we got a motel. There's two beds. Sorry, you're going to sleep with me. So here's these two paleontologists snuggling up in this skinny little bed. <laughs> it wasn't quite the romance of it, but it was a fun trip. Let's go to final calls, Peter. Let's start with Cheryl in Washburn, Missouri. Hey, Cheryl, thanks for holding. Um, this whole Jurassic kind of thing, Jurassic Park, it reminds me of this. Oh, this is a beautiful blue marble in our solar system. And given our crude record keeping in the past, I mean, we got some basics, but not that much information. Is it possible that we humans are freaking out um, as to a new evolution in our conceits about Earth? And that's the deal. It's like, it's our forever. Um, is she he evolving, dumping us in the process? I don't think we uh, can destroy the earth, but we can destroy ourselves. Uh, do you have any opinions about that? And thank you, Peter Ward is a great topic. Oh. Is planet Earth trying to get rid of us? Yeah, I mean, this is this is a little self-centered by us. It certainly seems to be that, that if I were a living planet and I had these vermin called humans running all over me and building dams and putting concrete and all that stuff, I, I'd try to get rid of those little little devils. Well, that's a little too personable. I mean, going back to this idea of the Gaia hypothesis, and one form of that hypothesis is that the Earth is a living creature. Well, we certainly can see what look like biotic systems. We see currents that seem to be like our, the blood flows in our body. We see nutrients moving from place to place. We have gas exchange. We have lots of different cells. The planet itself harbors life but isn't alive. So it might be just a little too personal thinking that the Earth has any access to deal with us. Um, we're doing a bad enough job ourselves. I don't think the Earth needs to do anything to us. We're, we're pretty good at it. Let's go to James in Newport News, Virginia. Hi, James. Thank you, sir. Go ahead. Hi, George. Hi, Peter. Hey. Hey, hey George. I just want to mention my book like you always let me do. If, uh, if you allow me to do it again. How could I not? Go ahead. I appreciate that. Bless, bless with an angel and a rainbow. And it, and it explains in there uh, what, what we're going through. This is the Revelation times and the rapture. I believe the rapture is coming in not a very long time. And the people who are on the planet that have chosen Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior are going to be rescued from this hell on earth. And it's just going to get worse and worse after that. And, the, and it also says in Revelation 12, which came true, September, it's a celestial event that came true September 21, I'm sorry, September 23, 2017. It says near the end of it, after Satan's cast down with a third of, the, a third of his angels that tried to overtake heaven, and they were defeated, and that could be millions of angels, according to a uh, number of angels in Revelation 5. But we don't know the actual number of angels, but we know they, they follow Satan. And it says near the end, therefore rejoice, rejoice O, heaven, o heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants. It doesn't say people. It says, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come, has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. So from that date, 
September 23rd, 2017. Uh, we're in 23 now, so he knows he has a short time. And that's warning the, the not only the people, but the inhabitants of the earth, including the, pe- the, the, the animals in the sea, apparently. So it's, a, it's an all-encompassing thing. We're having the terrible weather now. We're having open borders. There's all kinds of stuff other than animals disappearing. But th- that's included in that Revelation 12, which, which is a fact that it's a celestial event that actually happened um, on, on that date. Well, let me ask you this, Peter. You're a scientist, but do you ever go into the biblical end to, to tie it into any of this that's going on? Well, I have to say that I was raised a Roman Catholic, and my brother and I would sit through Mass, which was done in Latin, of course, so we didn't understand. And not understand it, that's right. And thing, but we had this revelation in Mass because, and we got really yelled at. There was a little prayer book, a little Bible, and we had pencils, so we drew a picture of what we thought based on all the available information about the ark. Uh, how big was it, Noah's Ark? And so we started thinking about all the animals, and we knew a lot of animals. And by the end of that very boring mass, my brother and I, we thought, nah, <laughs> that couldn't have happened. And the problem is, if you start disbelieving one thing, well, if they got that wrong, what about the rest of it? So I, I really, I, I have admiration for anyone who has such confidence and finds comfort, but I don't. I still don't know what Dominisco Visco means in Latin. Well, I, there was a whole lot of Latin that I didn't understand. I hated Easter because it was so somber. And I also actually probably almost ended my life. I was five years old, and I saw all these people at the end of Mass dipping their fingers in the holy water. I said, that must be good stuff. So I was able to grab that bowl, and I drank it. You, you drank it? <laughs> I did. <laughs> you know how many fingers were in that bowl? Yeah, I hate to imagine. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm beginning to wonder maybe this crazy life I've had because we're all back to that. Let's go to uh, Elijah in Charlotte, North Carolina, east of the Rockies. Hello, Elijah. Hey, how you doing? Great. Good to have you with us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I got two things. Okay. So, uh, speaking of plants and, uh, you know, everything. Uh, have you ever listened to the record Plantasia that came out by Mort Garson? No, I have not. I don't know it. Not, uh, it know it came out in the 60s. It was given away at Sears, but it, it was for plants to grow better. And I, I, I heard earlier someone talking about music and how possibly music can, like, make make things better, I guess. Well, it makes you feel better, that's for sure. Well, no, no, but, but I mean, like, it, it was, like, scientifically proven that this record helped plants grow. Oh, no, that's so, true. So, that's true. Pleasant music, or music that we call easy listening, does incredible things to life. Plant sure. life, water, all kinds of things. Absolutely. And then the second thing was... uh when you're talking about dinosaurs, the uh, the um, what what was his name in uh in like Sweden or something that like when a UFO went back in time and had pictures of dinosaurs. Don't know. You got me on that one. I'll check into that. I'll check into that. Time travelers, to be sure. George, I had a professor who was one of the early winemakers in Washington State, and we were talking about music affecting plants. Um, he he was making wine in his basement, and he was a classical pianist as well as a paleontologist, and he played classical music through his barrels 24-7. And when I first saw that, I said, wow, that's a little far out. And he said, oh, no, 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 the music makes the wine better. And who's going to just dispute that. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I did too. It was a great story. I mean, it's just maybe wrong, but he had beautiful, great wine and I tried the wine. It's fabulous. So why not? Next up, we've got Fred in Fraser Park, California. Let's get you in before we're out of time, Freddie. Go ahead. Uh, uh, hi, George. Hi, Peter. I think I know what's happening to the whales. I had the library look up a statistic. 
turns out 800 whales a year are killed off the West Coast. They're run over by ships. Uh, we, if you figure all the coasts around the world, I think there are supposed to be 50,000 ships at sea at any given time. Wow. I, th- I think the whales are just getting slaughtered, and maybe the no, killer I, whales are counterattacked. I, right. no, I think you're right. I mean, you're absolutely right. I, I have seen these ships out there, and they not only kill whales, they kill yachters. You know, I've known a lot of people that their dream was always to build a yacht, 40-foot cement boat, sail around the world, and then there's only two of them, a husband and a wife, and so you can't have watches. They get run over. They get hit by their propellers? They don't stop for anything, right? And if you get hit, they don't stop. So you're right. I mean, the whales are just being slaughtered by the ships. There's no doubt. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.